Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the EVO. Uh, this is uh, another EVO fellowship lecture. Today's lecture is the um, Professor Bernard uh, Chosid Memorial Fellowship, and actually it's Chosid, but uh, because of the hidden German standard, it's pronounced Chosid now. Uh, this is the Professor Bernard Chosid Memorial Fellowship and the Nat Natalie and Mendel Rakolin Memorial Fellowship in Eastern European Jewish Studies. Um, our lecturer today is uh, Dr. Vladimir Levine. He is the director of the Center for Jewish Art at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Levine was born in St. Petersburg uh, and holds a PhD from the Hebrew University. He's the author of the book from Revolution to War, Jewish Politics in Russia, 1907 to 1914. is also published in Hebrew, if uh, you're interested in that. He is the co-editor of the book Synagogues in Lithuania, a catalog, uh, to, um, uh, which was published in 2010, 2012. Uh, in 2017, he co-authored together with Sergei Kravtsov the book Synagogues in Ukraine, uh, Volinia, and he's currently working on a book of Jewish heritage in Siberia with Anna Berezin. Uh, Dr. Levine has published 120 articles and essays about social and political aspects of modern Jewish history in Eastern Europe, uh, among which are many articles on synagogue architecture and ritual objects, uh, and additionally, many other topics too numerous to mention here. Dr. Levine has also led numerous research expeditions to document synagogues and other monuments of Jewish material culture in Eastern and Central Europe, and has led several research projects in the field of Jewish art, the most important of which is the creation of the Betzalel Narkis Index of Jewish Art, the world's largest digital depository of Jewish heritage materials. Uh, his lecture today is entitled Jewish Brick and Mortar in the Russian Capital, the Architectural Dialogue Between the St. Petersburg Jewish Community and the Tsarist Metropolis. Please welcome uh, Dr. Vladimir Levine. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Eddie. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And thank you very much, everybody, for uh, coming. And I would like to start with another thanks to the Eva Institute for Jewish Research for this wonderful opportunity uh, to be here and uh, to work in the amazing collection, the amazing archives and library of the Eva Institute, uh, Institute, which are very, very important for my research or for different my researchers, I would say. Um, so thank you, thank you, Ivo, thank you. Grace Dank. <coughs> oh, what I uh, what I would like to present uh, what I would like to present you today is a discussion of the uh, Jewish architecture. In, uh, uh, yeah, you can still hear me. Yeah. Um, what I would like to present today is the discussion of the Jewish architecture in my native town, in my native city, uh, Saint Petersburg, or to be more precise, Leningrad. I, I was born and grew up in Leningrad. Uh, but uh, my conclusions, uh, I think they are valid for many, many other cities in the world, including this great city of New York. So, uh, and since we speak about architecture and architecture of the 19th century, it's easy to analyze with ideological and historical um, it's easy to ask this architecture, ideological, historical, identity questions. And I would like to start my talk with small explanation of the, uh, this period of architecture, architecture of historicism, when you choose historical styles for your new building. And uh, again, what I show in Saint, uh, for St. Petersburg, it works here in New York as well. Um, does it work? No. Is it on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I checked. It's, it's uh, always a problem. Yeah. So, um, oi. it's squashed a little bit, doesn't matter. So here you have uh, to understand architecture of historicism of the second half of the 19th century. 
we should start with the previous period, the classi uh, period of classicism. And here you have four churches in St. Petersburg, and I invite the public to guess to which denominations these churches belong. What would be uh, the ideas? Roman Catholic. Re which one? I think this one. This one. Roman Catholic, OK. Other? Is this one Orthodox? This one Orthodox? Two guesses more? <laughs> Okay, now the truth is revealed. And this explains, shows us, yeah, here the cross is different, exactly, yeah. But this shows us that for architects of classicism, where it is a language, architectural language, uh, uh, architectural norm which you apply to everything, be it Armenian church or German church, Russian Orthodox Church or Catholic Church, doesn't matter. There are the same laws of architecture which are employed, the same ideas and the same aesthetics. The uh, architecture of historicism, in contrast, says that we need to choose a right style fitting the building that we build. So, another example, also St. Petersburg. Can we guess here? It's obvious, yeah? And this one? Also Russian? Almost. Mm, no, no, no. Look, look, look here. Greek Orthodox, exactly. And this one, what we would say? Catholic or something uh, Protestant, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, 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 but it's okay, it's, it comes. If you have a church, it's a German church, you have German church, it would have some Gothic elements and some Romanesque elements, yeah? For Greek church, you take Hagia Sophia and, and copy it, and for the Russian church, you take uh, the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, style. Uh, so, when we speak about the synagogue in St. Petersburg, we can understand that this is the period when German churches are built in Gothic style, and Russian churches are built in uh, Russian revival style, and what, how Jews should pro, uh, mm, show off their identity, identity of their, uh, their building. <coughs> and, um, and one uh, additional remark, it is very important that uh, for our talk, is that in the Russian Empire, Jews are not equal citizens. There are no citizens in the Russian Empire. People are subjects of the empire, of course. But Jews have no civil rights. All their civil rights are restricted, and the most important restriction is the restriction on settlement. Jews could live in the Palon settlement, which is in the western part of the empire, St. Petersburg is outside of the Pale of Settlement. So, for Jews, it is very important to be presented in the capital in a dignified, as a uh, civilized people, as a dignified people, and this uh, we can uh, speak about architecture of emancipation by building something uh, in the Russian capital, those privileged Jews who settled in the capital, they show also that all the Jews uh, of the Russian Empire deserve uh, emancipation and, civ and civil rights. Oh, not ci ci sorry, not civil rights, of course, but equal rights. <coughs> and the community of St. Petersburg, it started officially in 1859, when the first Jews uh, merchants, rich merchants, were allowed to settle in, uh, in the city, and it continued until the revolution of 1970s, but the community was always headed by two families, one and a half family, the family of Ginsburgs, uh, bankers and the, uh, the uh, gold miners, and the family of Polyakov. Uh, uh, he, was, he was called the railway king of Russia, he built a lot of railways. Um, so, the same families 
headed the community uh, over uh, 70 years, uh, 80 years, and somehow we promoted the same ideas all over this mm, time. Okay, so when the Jewish community was established in 1859, Jews, of course, asked to build a synagogue, and it took them 10 years to receive permission from the Tsar, Alexander II, to build a synagogue. In 1869, they got this permission, and they started when you want to build a building, what you need first? <coughs> no, land. land. And they started to look for land. And the whole story, I must say, that the whole story that I'm going to tell today uh, could be divided into five parts or five acts. So we like in theater, yeah? So the first part will be uh, the part about the plot of land. So city already exists. City is splendid imperial capital with palaces, with churches. So Jews want to find a decent place. And I will quote the secretary of the community, who was also the renowned Maskilic Hebrew poet, Yudaleip Gordon, and he wrote, place a Jewish synagogue on Nevsky Prospect and its main avenue of the city, yeah. from palace to palace. Put, <coughs> put the synagogue on Nevsky Prospect and the common Russian passing by will take off his head and cross himself. Must be well holy if they put it here. But hide it in a suburb and he not only will regard the banished synagogue as something foul, but will infer that it's pleasing to God and therefore it is to throw out all the eats. Yeah? So it's ideological question where you place the synagogue. And of course Jews wanted nice places and I marked them in green. So one place here, it's one of the central streets at the corner that everybody will see it. Another place we try to buy here, this is an avenue which leads to Moscow, also a very prominent place. And the authorities, the city authorities, were against it and said, no, let's build synagogue somewhere far away. So, uh, let's move it somewhere far away and at the end, to buy, a, to buy a plot for the synagogue. It took almost 10 years. And at the end, Jews got this place marked in red. Um, it's very funny place. It's very close to the center. Here, for instance, is the theater. So all St. Petersburg elite comes to the theater. But you cannot see the synagogue from that place. And it's a poor neighborhood. You have, you have prison here, you have shipyards here. So Jews, in the first act of this dialogue, Jews did not succeed to get a prominent place uh, for, for the synagogue. And they got it somewhere here, very close to the center, but not in the center. And I think with the majority of people who live in St. Petersburg, now there are about five million uh, people in the city, majority of them never saw uh, the synagogue. Yeah, it's in a strange street. If you don't pass by here, you have no chance to see it. Okay, so the plot was bought. After you have a land, who said we need an architect? You need a project. Yeah? <coughs> and so community organized a <coughs> A competition for projects for the synagogues. We have two of such projects. What is in common in those projects? Domes, domes. domes exactly. <laughs> Look, here you have one dome and one huge dome and two smaller uh, domes on towers here. In, in this project, it's crazy. A huge one and smaller one and two even smaller and minor minarets, whatever. So it's domes. Why domes? Russian. Uh, besides Murish, Murish, we will speak in a couple of minutes. Domes. No, they don't similar. This is the idea. But the dome is a sign 
for a sacral building. You want to show that this is not simply a house where, where you have some prayer room inside, but this is a building intended for the worship, but it has sacral character, and therefore you want to put domes as much as possible, and you want it to be a grandiose building, grandeur. And again, the community speaks here the same language with the authorities, like in the case of the plot. So community chooses this project with with funny domes everywhere, submits it to the, in St. Petersburg, all facades has to be approved by the emperor. But of course, before it comes to the emperor, somebody has to write his opinion. And we have opinion of the city governor, and I will quote it. I think that the facade of the synagogue draws too much attention by its splendor. The building of the synagogue, built in this way, would overshadow all non-Orthodox temples in the capital and even some of the Russian Orthodox churches. Mm, but the existing, and here is the point, but the existing laws pertaining to Jews allow their settlement in the capital only as an exception. Permission to build a synagogue was given to the Jews only after long solicitation and as a special mercy. In such condition, the first synagogue in the capital should have a more modest outlook which would fit the situation of Jews in our motherland. So clearly, Jews want something big, something important to say we are here and we deserve to be equal subjects of this empire. And the authorities say, no, you are party and you should be modest. So for three years more, uh, the architects are trying to negotiate it, and this is the result of the negotiation. <coughs> From this huge building, they remain, uh, succeeded to, re, uh, to keep only the central, the first dome here, and it was a success, because this building has a dome, and when you see it, you understand that this is a sacral building, a building for worship. And I must say that the Soviet authorities later, we also didn't like that you, that you can recognize this building as a synagogue. So wonderful, they planted here wonderful trees. <laughs> and, mm, <coughs> and it's uh, concealed part of, part of uh, time, at least. Um, so, this was the second act of our dialogue, in which the Jewish community was much more successful than in the first, because it retained uh, one cupola, one dome. And so now we can speak about the third one, which is about the style. As, as you can see, uh, here you can't can see, as you can see, uh, the synagogue is built in new Moorish style, yeah? So it, it's oriental uh, style. Why? Why Jews in St. Petersburg should use kind of oriental style? Uh, sorry? The fashion. the fashion in Europe, but this is not exactly Europe, it's Russia. It's sometimes <laughs> sees itself as part of Europe and sometimes not. But the most important role in this decision played a Russian, very famous Russian uh, art critic, Vladimir Stasov. And he was, uh, those of you who like music, he was, uh, know, may know him, he was behind the Russian composers who, who created, like Mussorgsky, who created Russian national music. So he supported creating of Russian art in every field, in music, in visual arts, in other places. And he also supported Jews in creating Jewish art. And he was a friend of the uh, Ginsburg family. And in 1872, even before the plot for the synagogue was bought, he published a long article explaining how to build the synagogue. And what was his question, first question? He asked, he said, we are living in the age of awakening of nationalities. 
each nation and tribe would like to find and express on every meaningful occasion its very own distinctive makeup of lifestyle, originality, and beauty. Dispersed as it is in Europe, the Jewish tribe itself could not remain apart from the general movement, and it could not wish not to have synagogues in genuine Jewish style everywhere. So the key word here is genuine Jewish style. Where you find genuine Jewish style. And Stasov makes explanations. He said, OK, um, we would have genuine Jewish style from the motherland of Jews in Palestine, but we have nothing from there. We don't know about, and it's 1872. So we have no material from Palestine. But we can make extrapolations. And then he writes, OK, it's Semites, Jews are Semites, and other Semitic per, uh, people are Arabs. And of course, Jews influenced Arabs, so all Arabic architecture basically is Jewish architecture. And especially we can see it where in Spain, in medieval Spain, where Jews built synagogues in this Arabic style, this Moorish style, so the Jews felt well with this style, and we can use it as well. And then he continues, and it's very correct what did the, uh, what the communities, uh, modern communities in Europe have done already, and he cites Berlin and Leipzig as an example. So it's fashion, it's European fashion, which is explained with long art historian description. I'm not sure that today he would get some uh, credit for, for this art historian work, but in the 19th century it was okay. So he say, okay, we have uh, architecture, architecture of Arabs in Spain, we should build in the same way. And uh, this um, approach takes place already before the synagogue is built, because uh, it, I told you, yeah, it took 10 years to buy a plot. Before, during this time, the Jews established also a cemetery, and in the cemetery you need a cemetery chapel, some ceremonial hall. So the community builds the first chapel, and this chapel is in the neo Moorish style, of course. And where you find neo Moorish style, the elements for neo Moorish style, you go to Spain and you go to, of course, to Alhambra. And Alhambra is very, it's a famous monument, it's a famous palace complex, which is well published. There are a lot of albums in 19th century, there are a lot of albums produced with details of Alhambra architecture. So every architect everywhere can use it, and you can find, you can, we don't have too much time, to enter the uh, details, but you can see how these three arches are copied here, and this central arch is copied here, exactly, yeah? So you, you take Alhambra, and you use it for your own architecture. So the first Jewish building in St. Petersburg, which is in the cemetery, not in the city, in the cemetery, it was built in the Neo-Moorish style. And after it, we can see that neo Moorish style in St. Petersburg became reserved for Jewish buildings. And we can see it on another, because we find only another neo Moorish building in St. Petersburg, this huge uh, tenement house, apartment house, which was built by Prince Muruzi, and who also wanted to express his oriental origins. Somebody has the hints? Where he came from? Muruzi? Uh, hmm? Persia. No. Morocco? No. Iran? No. <laughs> Byzantine. It's a Greek family with old Byzantine roots. So, uh, and in 19th century, Byzantine and Moorish, it's almost the same. Yeah, it's Orient. So he sent architects to Alhambra, to Spain, to see Alhambra by their own eyes, so that they can build a building in the neo-Moorish style which would express his uh, oriental identity. 
But this is the only one building, non-Jewish building in St. Petersburg using this architectural language. Uh, and so not everybody was happy with Stasov's ideas that Jews should build in the new Moorish style. And one of the person who that we know that uh, um, corresponded with him was Mark Antakolsky, famous um, sculptor, Russian sculptor. Uh, he was a protege of Stasov. Stasov advanced his career, uh, invested a lot in advancing his career. And Antakolsky writes to Stasov, I will quote as well, that Moorish style is less suitable to the spirit of Jewish religion. This style is too light, too coquettish. There is in this style magic luxury, luxury in which fairy king live, but in no way is there anything that fills it with fear and adoration. So Antakolsky was thinking, and it, it shows that it is great, uh, he was really great artist because he was the first one who said that maybe this idea, this Moorish idea doesn't work, maybe we should go for something Egyptian. Jews worked there in Egypt in building. Uh, and they said it fits very well, but most important, and of course he proposes also, he says to Stasov, Maybe we should take the great synagogue of Vilna, and Antakolsky was born a block from this synagogue. Maybe we should take the great synagogue of Vilna as an example, as an idea for the new Jewish architecture. And this is very important. He writes it in the 70s, 1870s, before its generation, or two generations before, Jewish artists start to go to the, um, uh, to the art of Jews of Eastern Europe to look there for inspiration, like in the beginning of 20th century. Yeah, this is already a common uh, thing that you take, take an old synagogue and you try to translate it into modern architecture. But it's the beginning of 20th century. In 1870s, nobody was thinking that the art of Jews in the Pale of Settlement is worth as a source for new contemporary art. Exactly like with Yiddish. Nobody in the 70s thought that Yiddish is a language and the culture of both Jews and the Pale of Settlement is worth of something, of, of paying attention. It's not corrupt jargon, yeah? and it's not corrupt Polish long, uh, long dresses, and not corrupt behavior, but it's something that is valued. So Antakolsky was the first. But to, um, to have arguments with Stasov, it was very problematic. He was a very strong person. And we have letters of Antakolsky to Stasov, and we don't have his replies. But it's understandable from the next letter that Stasov said something very strong, and Antakolsky says, OK, OK, let's, let's do it as you, as you like. Another position to Stasov's idea about Moorish style came from this guy. You remember him? Yeah, yeah? Udaleib Gordon. And Udaleib Gordon published an article in which he says, why? Why new Moorish? Uh, let's do it in, uh, in the Russian style. Let's remove crosses and other Christian uh, details and build this synagogue in the Russian style. Why neo Moorish? And I like this citation. And he says, for the synagogue in our time, the Moorish style is obligatory in the same degree as the Arabic language in which Spanish Jews of those times wrote is obligatory for contemporary Jewish writer. And we should remember that Yudalib Gordon, he is the author of this phrase, be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. And when I uh, bring this phrase to my Israeli students, usually they think that it's, uh, uh, they believe that this phrase was said by Moses Mendelssohn, the founder of Ascala, of Jewish Enlightenment movement. But it's Gordon who coined this phrase. And his approach to St. Petersburg Synagogue was exactly in line with this idea. Let's build, we are in the streets, let's build like decent people do. 
Um, but the argument between Gordon and Stasov was resolved in a kind of natural way, but it was parallelly, there was a conflict between the community with Chabad Hasidim, and Chabad wanted another rabbi, uh, and uh, they announced Gordon to the authorities for something, is, and he was kicked out of the city, but Stasov remained and pushed his idea till the end, so the synagogue was indeed built in the neo-Moorish style, and we can see uh, this is the uh, interior of a small synagogue, for instance, and all these small stucco details are taken from an album of Alhambra uh, ornaments, or if we look at the columns, here are columns from Alhambra, and this is how the details from those columns are incorporated in the columns of the synagogue in St. Petersburg. And um, by education, I'm not an art historian who easily does these comparisons. I am a social historian, and so I need texts. And I was very happy that after all this, I, th I think it explained itself, it's uh, obvious. But when I found in the report of the building activities for the St. Petersburg Synagogue that they bought two albums of Alhambra, I was happy. So it's, the, I know from we, exactly from which albums they copied those small details. But Alhambra was not the only source for architects in St. Petersburg. Another source, and probably more important, was the new synagogue in Berlin, Oranienburgerstrasse Synagogue. Uh, this was a very important synagogue for German Jews, for Prussian Jews, and it was also well published, and they published an album of the synagogue even before it was built. And we know that the St. Petersburg community bought this album, and we see how it worked. Yeah, the whole idea that you have an apse with a kind of kiborium in front of the Torah Ark and a gallery for a choir here was repeated in St. Petersburg almost one by one. You have this apse, a gallery for a choir, and the kiborium in front of the uh, Torah Ark. But we cannot say that St. Petersburg architects were simply copying things without thinking. We also brought interesting elements from other places. And this one was mentioned by uh, Rachel Wischnitzer, the founder of Jewish art as a discipline. It's an academic discipline. Um, for this cupola, one cupola from the many which remained, the architects took the ideas of Mamluk architecture in Cairo. And when I first time came to Cairo, I was jumping from one mausoleum to another with cry, oh, it's our synagogue. <laughs> no, it, it looks like our synagogue. Yeah, so this, is, this element is unique for, in synagogue architecture for St. Petersburg. And after St. Petersburg synagogue was built, others in, in the Russian Empire started to copy it. For example, this Elizabethgrad synagogue, they took this cupola and multiplied it in two, small, but with the same idea. And the interior of St. Petersburg synagogue also influenced others. For instance, in, uh, the uh, choral synagogue in Vilnius, they repeated this idea, yeah, you have an app, so we have an apse, a gallery for choir, we have a gallery, you cannot put choir there, but gallery we have, and the keyboardium in front of the ark. And after the St. Petersburg Synagogue was uh, finished and inaugurated in uh, 1893, the new Moorish wave swept through the Russian, uh, Russian Empire, and we find new Moorish synagogues everywhere, inside the Pale of Settlement, like here in Minsk, outside the Pale of Settlement, like in Samara, in Kishinev. Before, before St. Petersburg, uh, Russian Jews did not build in the neo Moorish style. After St. Petersburg, they started to produce numerous 
uh, Muri, new Moorish synagogues. At the time when in Europe, already this fashion faded out. Nobody built in Europe. In, in 1913, nobody built Moorish synagogues in Europe anymore. Um, but in Russia, yes. But we must remember that it was not the only choice, because other synagogues could be built in other styles. For instance, the synagogue of Brodsky in Kiev, it has so many Russian elements, so many Russian details from the Russian, from the uh, um, national neo-Russian style, and that it fits to the atmosphere of Kiev, which is uh, the Russian chronicle, the old Russian chronicle says that Kiev is the mother of Russian cities. It's what Ukrainians today are fighting with. Yeah? It's mother of the Russian cities. So in Kiev you build in the new Russian style like Gordon wanted for St. Petersburg. And from Kiev you go to smaller places around and you imply those Russian elements in other synagogues. Yeah? Here or here or here. You can see it. Yeah? So it's another choice. You are not obliged to go in the new Moorish vein. Or another choice could be classical. And in this way, the classicism is also a kind of language of emancipation, because if you, you can analyze classical style in many ways. One of them would say that classical style comes from the ancient Greece, where all people were, see, not all, but many people were equal citizens. So it's a, a spirit of citizenship which you uh, transfer, which you project outside. So it was made in Warsaw, and after it, it was made in Moscow in well. But let's go back to St. Petersburg. <coughs> Sorry. So the, um, this neo-Moorish idiom was used for building the Jewish building of the Russian capital. Uh, but since it take, took so long to build the synagogue, the history of art developed, and even Vladimir Stasov with his ideas also developed and found new things. And when the next time he was, uh, um, he has to uh, had to deal with the question what style Jews have to build in. He had a new answer. He found in the Imperial Public Library in Saint Petersburg, he found a huge collection of Jewish medieval manuscripts from the Firkovich collection, which this library bought. It, uh, uh, when he found this collection and became acquainted with this collection, he initiated the publication of an album of ornaments from Hebrew medieval manuscripts. So for him, Stasov looked for, you remember, genuine Jewish style. So for him, manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, were much more genuine than the Moorish architecture from Spain because Manuscripts produced by Jews for Jews in uh, 10th, 11th, 12th century. So we, together with Baron Ginsburg, uh, a son of, uh, uh, of the head of community, who was a scholar, he produces this album with ornaments that everybody who is interested in Jewish ornament can use it. And how you produce album in 19th century when you don't have photography? Uh, what you do? Hmm? No, but yeah, but if you want the whole page, but if you want details, exactly. You take a painter, you take an, uh, uh, you, t uh, you invite an artist who will copy it. So it's everything here is hand copied. And the responsible for this album was an, uh, 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 an architect, Russian architect, whose name was Ivan Ropet. And he produced also the cover for this album, 
where he combined a lot of every every uh, every detail in this cover is taken from a manuscript. We can find it in manuscripts. And this architect Rapet, he was also protege of Stasov, and in his buildings in St. Petersburg, he built them in the national Russian style with a lot of small Russian details, and he, he produced it uh, for Jews with Jewish details. And the community of St. Petersburg began to use this album for objects. And they presented Tsar with uh, uh, some small present, a gift, which we don't know how it looked like, but we have text which says it was made on the basis of the album. Then we needed a Nertamid for a synagogue to, mm. they did it uh, with this, those ornaments. And what we have is, for instance, the parochet, the Torah art curtain for the synagogue, which we combined as well. They took details from there, from here, and combined a genuine Jewish style, which is not Moorish anymore, it's not Alhambra anymore, but it's style taken from the manuscripts. And the um, development of this idea and it's the only case, as far as I know, when the ornaments from manuscripts were brought to architecture and the fence for St. Petersburg Synagogue was built exactly on the base of those ornaments. Uh, the architect, architect who did it, who, who did the design for it, was the same Ivan Ropiet. Yeah, here is his name. But he was a lazy guy. So he didn't use the original manuscript again. He used his uh, cover, yeah, his uh, album cover. And you can see you have this um, square with ears, you have it here. The, uh, the, uh, this form, which appears in the manuscript, presents in the temple of Jerusalem. You can find it here, and you can find it here, and so forth. Um, we today would say that it was a brilliant idea. But as it seems, in St. Petersburg, it was not conceived as brilliant. And how we can check it? If we go to the Jewish cemetery. And in the Jewish cemetery of St. Petersburg, we find a lot of mausolea built by rich people in all kinds of oriental styles. But again, we don't find there something that comes from the manuscripts, besides only one monument. And this is the grave of Antakolsky. And then who stood behind the grave of Antakolsky, who organized everything when he died? It was, of course, Stasov. And we see how the grave repeats. Just, OK, just one part. This menorah comes here. And Stasov, for Stasov, Antakolsky was an ideal figure of a national artist. He was Jewish. And he didn't hide his Jewishness. And when Stasov organized a celebration of, 20, of 25 years of, of, of Antakolsky's activities, he gave him an address. So the address was prepared as a, a, a scroll of Esther, written, you remember, those forms we had in manuscripts in the album. And the case was also prepared. Who made the design? Our friend Ivan Ropet. And we know that he was a lazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he already had this design in his original cover of the album. And this, uh, this uh, congratulatory address to Antakolsky it, it has it influenced people. It, it, it was noted. It was so unusual. So we have such a picture where Stasov <laughs> presents Antakolsky with uh, this uh, uh, address. And as I said, Antako for Stasov, Antakolsky was an ideal Jewish artist. He made Russian 
art and Russian topics, like Ivan the Terrible and others, but he worked on Jewish topics as well. And he was perceived by others as a Jew, and we have here Repin's uh, drawing of Antakolsky in kind of Talit. I'm not sure that Antakolsky uh, was an observant Jew, but uh, Repin depicted him in this way. And when it came to the Antakolsky's grave, Stasov said, OK, for the national Jewish artist, we have to use uh, national, genuine Jewish uh, art, genuine Jewish ornament, which was taken from the manuscript. But when, when Stasov died and David Ginsburg um, uh, died, nobody in the community, in the St. Petersburg community, was ready to follow this idea and then the Kolsky grave is the last instance when the uh, mm, ornaments from Jewish manuscripts were used for Jewish objects or Jewish uh, construction activities in St. Petersburg. And probably it was too strange. In this we see in the last building built in St. Petersburg for Jews, it was a new cemetery chapel. So this is a design for this chapel. It is kind of oriental still, but it's another oriental language. And what is most important here are these pylons, which speak another architectural language, and they come from reconstructions of Jerusalem temple. Since nobody knows how Jerusalem temple looked like, there are a lot of reconstructions. And in the late 19th century, new reconstructions appeared, especially this one by Charles Chapier, which were based on the archaeological discoveries, but not in Palestine. Nobody still made archaeology on the Temple Mount, but in Babylonia and Mesopotamia. So there, and such pylons were found uh, at the entrances to uh, temples and to palaces. So if Babylonians built in this way, why Jews didn't build this way? So this is the reconstruction of temple, which became very powerful. And it's repeated here. So this building, it says, OK, I, I, I am a kind of replica of the temple. But when the building was built, it was changed a little bit. And we can understand that it was intervention of community. For Ge uh, Gewirtz, the Jewish architect in St. Petersburg, he wanted to have temple. That's all. But for the community, it was important to have oriental things. And here, the temple, temple parts remained, but they lost their centrality and the um, the more massive elements of those arches, oriental arches, were employed to give it oriental flavor. Where you find an, um, a model for such an ar uh, for those arches? It's not Alhambra anymore, but you go to Central Asia. And not because, not only because Central Asia is part of the Russian Empire now. <coughs> it's because of the architects of the beginning of the 20th century, they are looking for new, for new uh, forms which they can imply, uh, employ in their architecture. In the same years, approximately, a mosque in St. Petersburg is also built uh, using as an example a mosque in Samarkand. And another, uh, Givirz built another synagogue in Kharkov. He also used those language taken from uh, Central Asia. And it was very, um, very much in line with new styles developing in Europe at that time. The style which in Europe we call Art Nouveau. And in Russia, it's somehow called modern. And especially in St. Petersburg, it is called Northern Modern, Modern of North. So you look for new forms which allow you to express 
when you art, uh, artistic ideas, but you look for them in history. And we have uh, the same in the church architecture. Yeah? If in the late 19th century, a new church in St. Petersburg took as an example Moscow architecture with, with thousands of small details and many, many different colors, and small, uh, uh, really small uh, uh, um, um, the, uh, very detailed uh, views. In the beginning of 20th century, architects go for another, uh, uh, for other Russian ar architectural heritage in the north, where it's much more massive and much more uh, um, less has less details that uh, works with the contemporary architectural language. So, in St. Petersburg, it, uh, um, uh, the same thing happened, but to make a new oriental building for St. Petersburg's Jewish community, uh, Gewirtz went to uh, Central Asia and not to Spain. To summarize what we saw, the Jews wanted yeah, I have time to summarize. Yeah. Jews, St. Petersburg <laughs> Jews, wanted to be visible in St. Petersburg cityscape. They wanted to be visible through a different architectural language to express their identity. And for their identity, they found oriental forms. In the beginning, Moorish coming from Alhambra, later uh, Central Asian. So it doesn't matter if it's Central Asian or this is uh, South uh, Spanish. It's Oriental. This is what matters. But the community cre it created its own view. It created a complex of its building, but they were not very prominent in the cityscape. As we saw in the beginning, the synagogue is in a side street, and you can a uh, majority in, uh, of uh, people in St. Petersburg never saw it. The cemetery structure is, uh, of course, at the cemetery. Even less people see it. So the Jewish community created a kind of ensemble uh, produce, uh, expressing its identity through the oriental buildings, which are not really seen by other people, but only by Jews themselves. And uh, this is, was idea which initially was started to represent Jews in the eyes of the uh, Christian, in the eyes of the authorities. But at the end, it ended up uh, as uh, the in representation of Jewish community in the eyes of its own uh, members. And one of the historians wrote about St. Petersburg that St. Petersburg Jews exhibited both remarkable adaptation in, to their new surrounding and the Biden separateness. And I think that this story of building, of looking for a, a visual ways to express their, uh, their presence and their identity, it ended with creation of the ensemble which served uh, mostly the Jewish community, but it failed in pro projecting its image to be present in the cityscape, to be part of the uh, fabric of the city of St. Petersburg. So that's all. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I will be glad to try to answer them. Yeah, the question is, uh, yes, please. Uh, Size-wise, how does the St. Petersburg synagogue compare to the other great synagogues of Europe, like Dohani and Budapest? You know, once I gave a lecture on St. Petersburg synagogue, and I got only one question. How many seats are there? I said, <laughs> I said OK, it's about 1,000. And after the lecture, the woman came to me and said, but our synagogue in Budapest is much larger. <laughs> so, so it's about 1,000 seats. It's, it's, a, it's a large synagogue, but it's not the largest. What is the largest? Uh, Budapest, of course. <laughs> yeah, you have somebody here had a question? 
and when yeah, yes, right. please. So where were the Jews? The Jews had been in St. Petersburg for a number of years. Where were they worshiping before the synagogue was built? Did they have little shiva? Like yes, the yes, they established a small synagogue, and, and when we moved it, and when we established many other synagogues, even when the synagogue was built, the permission to build the synagogue included a clause that when it is built, all other synagogues should be closed. So, and this synagogue nobody besides the communal leadership needed. So all the real from uh, Eden, they wanted the small stivlech. And when the building was opened, the pol police started to close the stivlech. All of them moved in this building in separate rooms, <laughs> in the cellar, in the wings, and they continued their existence. Some of them existed even in the Soviet, in the Soviet time, and these were kind of officials. Yeah. Yes. No. Um, it's funny. None of the Russian czars never visited a synagogue in the 19th century. We know Peter the Great visited the synagogue in Mstislavl. But in the 19th century, there were other European monarchs who were obsessed, like Franz Josef in Austro-Hungary. He was obsessed with going to synagogues. <laughs> uh, the Russian czars, I, I, I researched this topic, none of the Russian czars of the 19th century ever visited any synagogue somewhere. Maybe this is a problem, and it's real. It's a real relationship between Zars and the Jewish subjects. Yes, please. Two quick questions. Um, you showed us the original cemetery chapel and the second one. Did they destroy the first one? Yes. The yeah. One? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it was wooden, so uh -huh. it dilapidated. And the second question, so when they established the synagogue, did they, did they do it directly in the Orthodox synagogue, or they did a progressive, or reform? When, when they established, I didn't get it. The synagogue. Yes. No, it's good. It's, it's a good question. Um, we can say that there was no reform movement in Russia. But there was a quasi-reform movement. But people tried to behave, to establish uh, synagogues where Jews would behave as normal and not as Jews. And as a model, of course, we used reform synagogues in Germany and in Austria. So the idea, this synagogue, of all synagogues are called choral. The idea is not only that you have a choir, but that you sit in rows and don't move. Many women separate? Separate, of course. In Germany, in German reform, it was also separate. It's only in America that men and women sit together. In Europe, we have two instances that, uh, of mixed sitting, with on, uh, that's all. So it was not a choral, but it was also, you sit on your place, you don't move, you don't speak, you don't answer a man or whatever loudly, uh, and you are dressed up. Uh, so this is, was to project an image of civilized, ki uh, kind of civilized community. And this is what they wanted. Uh, some of reform synagogues moved the bima toward the ark. Some didn't do it. So in, P in St. Petersburg, uh, maybe we can go to this uh, picture. Uh, well, any anything? Uh, yeah, here. So for instance, in St. Petersburg. The beam was placed in front of the ark, but uh, 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 our written sources say that in initially it was placed somewhere in the middle to, uh, to work with Orthodox. And then, when Orthodox in any case didn't come to pray there, it was moved to, uh, toward the Torah ark. No, in Spanish Portuguese, it's in the Western end, but it's another uh, tradition. In Ashkenazi tradition, 
uh, Bima is in the middle, and then you move it, uh, when a German reformer started to move it uh, toward the Ark in the beginning of 19th century, there's a strong orthodox opposition to it. Uh, Hatam Sofer, maybe uh, many of you have heard of Hatam Sofer, who wrote that uh, Hadash Asur Minatura, the new is prohibited by the Torah. And it, he wrote it about the Bima. It was not about something very important. It was about uh, the placement of Bima in synagogue. It became a sign, kind of sign. And for organ, uh, many choral synagogues in Russia had organ, which were used for weddings and for uh, Hanukkah and Purim uh, uh, prayers, not on Saturdays and not on holidays. Only two synagogues, both of them in Odessa, played organ on Saturday and holidays, and both played by a, a Christian organist. So another question. Yeah. And it's been restored recently. Yes, it was. It's why I'm showing uh, black and white photographs and not uh, uh, mm. color, because after restoration it changed. Uh, so I don't like how it changed. At least it's now in the hands of Chabad. Of, uh, uh, so of course they moved Bima to the center because they cannot pray with Bima uh, close to the Ark. So it's changed, that's why I'm using uh, uh, black and white photographs made before the current restoration. More questions? So why can't you have the Bima in front of the Ark? What is that? Because uh, the Ashkenazi tradition says that it should be in the center. It's re okay, it's religious. It became a sign of orth Orthodox Judaism that you have Bima in the center. And reform, reform in Germany, they move it to, towards the Ark. Yes, please. Uh, were the Holocaust in Ginsburg families the major patrons and uh, benefactors of the uh, synagogue? And what do you know of their fate uh, during World War II, after World War II? Ah, World War II is not relevant here in this story at all because what is relevant is the Russian Revolution. Um, Polakovs, I don't know if somebody exists, because there were three brothers, Polakov, one was sitting in St. Petersburg, another was in Moscow, and the third one was in South Russia, and he worked with Persia. He was a kind of agent, Russian agent for Persia, and two of them had no children, and St. Petersburg Polakov had a child, who was estranged from the community, and in the end they have a court case that he didn't pay uh, part of his inheritance with, uh, to the synagogue, and how it ended, I don't really understand. With Ginsburgs, it was better, so it was three generations of Ginsburgs who were heads of the community, and uh, after the revolution, they moved uh, to Europe, and there is today in uh, Switzerland, there is Baron Ginsburg who continues uh, the dynasty. Yes. Did they have a, uh, did they house a school, a Jewish school there, or did they have separate Jewish schools? In synagogue? No, yeah, in the synagogue. Did they have, have some kind no, of after, after they built the synagogue, they have this space in the plot. So they attached, they built, uh, I will show you. Yeah. So, Next to the synagogue, they built a building for the school. So this is the idea of urban synagogue that you start to put everything together. And it was a school by the Society for Spread of Enlightenment among Russian Jews. Yeah. Was there a mikvah? Sorry? Was there a mikvah? Uh, not in the synagogue. Not in the synagogue. But in the city, yes, yes. 